Hey, my name is King, or as some of you might know me better, Israel. I've gotten around, but hopefully you recognize me from my own channel, King Tannic. There's a new show coming to the Burr Network that I think is pretty exciting. Welcome to the Otaku Experience, hosted by yours truly. There is going to be a weekly series where we dive into the news and the world of anime, manga, and whatever the heck else Japan has to offer us. The show will be pre-recorded and premiere on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Pacific time or 5 p.m. Eastern right here on the Burnett Network YouTube channel. Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood Podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it? Especially if you love the movies. Our observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Sci-Fi and Cinema, your Evangelist of the Imagination, and the still-as-yet-undefined existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I'm robcasting you, uh, Rob casting at you from his, this, I can't even speak today, the, I'm so excited for my guest, the Rob Observatory. This is Rob Observations number eight. 137. It's an uh, amazing time, and uh, I'll tell you why it's March. Some people would talk about the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March. But I think of March as one of the greatest days of the month. Comes along once a, week, once a year. It's March 22nd, and it is, in fact, William Shatner's 92nd birthday coming up this month. And I figured, you know, there's a YouTuber I've wanted to stream with for a while. I haven't had him on the show, but I thought about him. You know, we've talked about we've talked about streaming. He, too, is Canadian. He has a long, rich history in the entertainment business. He comes out of comedy. You know him as former network executive. But we know him. We love him. It's Paul Chattel, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Paul, <laughs> to the 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 to Rob observations and look at that he's Woo! got his Star Trek Barbie dolls he's got Yeoman Rand and James Tiberius Kirk getting Randy in a box that's right uh, that's right Yeoman Randy Yeoman Randy Paul it's so good <laughs> to have you here on the show and uh, to be able to talk to you about I don't know if he's your favorite Canadian he's certainly one of mine oh oh uh, for sure he's 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 right up there. Um, I, I've, I have been looking forward to joining you on a, uh, cast together cause I'm a big fan of your work also. Oh, well, thank you. And this is a, a thrill for me. I, well, it's, you know, it's, I've been watching your meteoric rise on, Ooh. on YouTube. How long has it been? What a year have you been on YouTube for a year? It's, well, I've got two YouTube, um, eras. One oh. was a comedy tech YouTuber for about five years okay and then then um that sort of caught on kind of sort of but you know I, I, unless the comedy was sophomoric <laughs> you know they didn't really cotton on to it and then about a year ago i went you know what uh, tech has gotten boring um uh, prices have gone out of you know through the roof right there's no point in building computers anymore and I went, well, the other thing that I've always loved, and my background is in TV. I spent more time, uh, you know, doing TV, comedy, entertainment, cartooning. Uh, you know, that was my life. And I never thought of doing that for YouTube. And then one day I came up with the idea of, well, you know what? I am I actually had issues with some of the criticism channels that right. did not, not that what they were saying was wrong. It's just I knew stuff 
from behind the scenes because I was a former network executive and I spent three years in Hollywood um, jetting back and forth. And I went, you know what? I think people need, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a back end experience why decisions are made and 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 people getting emotional about certain decisions and i did you know, my first show i think i said look my only job as a network executive was to keep my job right i don't care about quality you know <laughs> i there, watched no that quality, i watched that stream there's no quality knob on tv i mean there's you know only only volume <laughs> you know that's that well, was the joke. So I went, okay, this show is actually okay from a network perspective, even if you hate it. It, it ticks a bunch of boxes. So, well, I've I've you know. really enjoyed uh, both your criticism and your commentary. Well, thank you. You know, I think that you've you've especially you've done reviews of a number of different shows, and and it's it's your your you know sometimes I feel like like. I love all of our fellow YouTube pundits, but I was telling you before we started that it would be nice to have, you know, sometimes more of a business perspective brought into, look, I can be as vitriolic as anybody, especially about Star Trek Discovery. But, um, and you know, no offense to anybody who works on it that you might know. It's uh, bringing I, a lot I know of money. quite a few people working on it. Bringing a lot of money to the Toronto area. That, yeah. You know, I'm all about that, you know, um, uh, which is great. Um, and I think, though, though that our... Uh, beef with the show comes more from the the writing uh, end of it all, and, and the size of the set. Uh, and the oh man, <laughs> I, I honestly and, and the fact that it has reflective floors. I I I, I like I, I there are so many questions I have from a production standpoint of yeah, yeah. that show that I and, but yeah the size of the sets make no sense to me, and and I I don't think there was a lot of thought given to the internal layout of a starship. When you see the cut, they cut the, they even had a, I think it was with the end of the third season, no, second season, when they have a, a huge fight scene on a turbo lift on the outside of the turbo lift, you know, and there's I all this, up after season two, there's all this empty open space. And I'm like, where, where do they think this is in the ship? Like, especially, I mean, I haven't, since I was eight years old, I've had blueprints of starships oh. and, and there's no empty space in them. I mean, no. other than a hangar deck, cause you have to land a shuttlecraft in there. You know, have you not been on a ship? It's just, but no, I've really enjoyed your your commentary, and I figured it's so great to uh, to speak with you. But what was so? Th I thought the perfect thing for us to talk about was <laughs> this ad for Paramount Plus. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> especially that comes out in William Shatner's birthday That's month. Right. And you know, I've I've I have made a movie with William Shatner. I'll show a clip from that. That's also a comedy. But so it's for those of you brilliant, who, brilliant movie. Oh well. Love it. Love thank it. You. If I do yeah. say something, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh they by the way, we sold the movie because we went to a film festival in Winnipeg in the dead of winter, which I'll which I'll tell you about. Oh, I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> uh but so here's the picture in question that was floating around. It's a Paramount Plus ad. And it harks back to Star Trek Day. And as you can see in the center is, is Michael Burnham and then Picard and Anson Mount in the center, which I guess I can understand because... And then, of course, you have Prodigy and you have Lower Decks. So you have the five shows currently in production or currently airing, which I understand. And then you have, of course, Janeway and Seven of Nine from Voyager. You have Avery Brooks from... Cisco from Deep Space Nine. You have Archer from Enterprise. And then you have Spock and Uhura. And that sort of perplexes me um, because as you as you look at all these things, I mean, I guess the animated characters aren't necessarily captains and Seven of Nine isn't a captain, but there is, I think, an egregious missing Who is it? element. Can, can we put out a uh, survey? Uh, who... Which individual is missing from that that group of people? I wonder who it is, Robert. Uh, I I I don't know. Now oh, I God. think from the business standpoint, I would say that both Spock, Uhura has been Zoe Saldana plays Uhura in the movies, and they're talking right. about doing a fourth one. Spock is now being, of course, played by Ethan Peck, and I actually think quite well. Yeah, I, I, I do think too. I like I, his. I do too. I don't like his haircut. I don't like the weird sideburns or whatever they 
but I think as in terms of a performance, I think he actually does yep. quite well. But it, it was really interesting to me that Shatner has, I mean, they had these Star Trek days and the first time they had a Star Trek day, they talked about all the existing Star Trek shows except the animated series, the original animated series. Which, which is, I really enjoyed. I did too. And if you go back and, and you look at it, a lot of the original writers from the original series worked on it. Yeah. You had you had most of the original voice actors, with the exception of Walter Koenig, who wasn't there, but but he wrote an episode called The Infinite Vulcan. I so didn't he, know that. Yeah. So he was involved. But you know, there's been a lot of William Shatner, who I wanted to be. He was my childhood idol, and I grew up to still admire him, and I got to work with him, and he's one of my favorite, you know, people in the world. It's been interesting to see at 92, he's going to be 92 on March 22nd, that he's sort of fallen from favor. I mean, the man went to space. Well, the the upper, upper, actually the low Earth orbit. He went to space. No, no qualifications. Yeah, he, he went to space. He went to space. He went to space. Yeah, went now, to space. I mean, I would ask you, growing up in Canada, I mean, Shatner goes all the way back to things like the uh, – uh, Whoa. Dur Judgment Twilight. at Nuremberg and Twilight what? Zone. Twilight Zone, of course, Star Trek. The uh he was he was Man from Uncle trained. He went to Stratford. You know, he's oh, yeah. a Shakespearean actor. He was a contemporary Christopher of Plummer. Christopher Plummer. What was it like? You grew up you spent your whole life in Canada. You're born and bred Canadian. Right. I'm still here. What does it mean? What does William Shatner mean to you as a Canadian? What do you, what do you guys think about? When were you first aware of him? Well, that's that's an interesting point. There's a bunch of other people who I'm more aware of as Canadians. Um, that that's a strange. That's an interesting question. I mean, Plummer, Jim Carrey. There's just p other people who I put under the and, and then writers, Stan Daniels. I mean, and Shatner was just I think on another level. That that was different he was shatner i i you know it's funny that you asked that i i just never thought of him as canadian i knew he was i mean he was right. from montreal um but it didn't matter to me as as much that's a funny question i mean he was shatner he was captain kirk uh you know my the first time i saw him i believe was in man from uncle but i didn't recognize him he, right he was, sure he was a, a bit player on many many uh shows but i mean star trek was I saw the original run. I'm old enough to have seen it, and it just like blew me away. And if memory site. serves, you know, I think it debuted the night before it debuted originally in the United States. It S debuted here in Canada first. Yeah, I think it was September 7th, but it debuted in September 8th here in the States, 1966. Yeah. So Star Trek will turn 57 years old this year. Um, and which yeah, and crazy. I almost didn't see it because we had an American TV guide and it had the wrong date. <laughs> but I got to see it and wow. I mean, I just remember the laser, I mean the phaser rifle. The fa yeah. The the fake rocks and they're not ugh. fake. What are you talking about? <laughs> the foam rocks. You know, it's it's interesting because that was, of course, the second pilot. Yeah. You know, but it wasn't the first episode aired. The first episode aired was the man trap. And and with what, the salt, with yeah, the salt, with the salt vampire, salt and sucking woman. The the third episode was the pilot where no man has gone before with the iconic, but it was it was with Sally Kellerman. With Sally Kellerman, yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, Sally, Ke she was great by the way as Elizabeth oh, Daner. Oh, oh my god, she was great, so I, good. I hear you, Kirk. Oh God, <laughs> it was great. Oh, you know, and when when she her, she's taking on Gary Mitchell. Gary Lockwood yes. is Gary Mitchell. Um, right. uh, y you know, it was interesting because at the time, science fiction television, you, you did have the great anthology shows like Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and things Outer like Limits. Thriller. But science fiction, you had Irwin Allen making Lost in Space. <laughs> yes. But there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, I mean, Star Trek, con comparatively speaking, was fair. I mean, Twilight Zone and, and Outer Limits were, they were very high-minded uh, in terms of what they were going for, in terms, but of but I would say that the writing style was similar. You, you, yes. They were, I believe, they were of a family. Yes, I agree. And there was some crossover. 
obviously there was a lot of crossover with Twilight Zone, the writers, um, oh, Richard yeah. Matheson and things like that. And the the what I found really interesting, I mean, I was born in 67, so I didn't start watching Star Trek until it was in strip syndication. It was, you know, when I was five years old, I've been obsessed with it ever since. But what's I'm interesting- I'm way older than you. <laughs> well, it's okay. It's okay. We can still be friends. Okay, All my yeah. friends are younger than me too. And they're like, that, that old, it, it's almost like- I um, tell everybody I'm 80 and they go, Paul, you look fantastic. <laughs> We we stay young. That's what all this newfangled contraption the the internet's for, to I keep think so. to keep us all young. But at the time, you know, do you remember? Like for me, growing up, I always thought that Canada, in a way, beginning with Kirk, and then when I became a Cronenberg fan, Cronenberg made Canada seem to me slightly. And growing up in Seattle, I had been to Victoria mm. and I'd been to Vancouver and. I started my drinking career in Vancouver. Um, but I always felt that Canada was slightly, in a way, a little bit, this sounds strange, but a little bit more futuristic than the United States, only because watching both Shatner and then watching Cronenberg movies, which always seemed to have mad scientists on the mm. cutting edge of whether it was uh, scanner technology or, or Dr. Hal Ragland's psychoplasmics and the brood or the weird... Uh, cosmetologists or cosmetic surgeons that cause Marilyn Chambers to get a stinger in her armpit and rabid, you know, or or the crazy futuristic apartment building that was taken over and shivers. So I always felt like, okay, you have Captain Kirk on the Enterprise, and then the Canadians are always doing some weird, cutting edge, mad modern science. And and we had some uh, good B movie SFX people like uh, Stephen Lennick. Yeah. Well, and you made movies like Visiting Hours with Shatner and Michael Ironside. Yep. You know, yep. and and things like that. So, and you brought up the Star Lost with Kier yep. Dulé, which um, was done at the CTV Studios. I was actually on the set of that. Really? So, yeah. Wow, it not I a very called... good show. No, nope, not nope. not to impugn. It was a good try. It was a good try. And it was it was interesting. You know, it was an interesting. Harlan Ellison. Yes. Wrote, yes. Wrote. Yeah, I would. You know what? It's funny. I've, I've only seen. I'd love. I don't know if like a remastered DVD set exists or something, but I would love to see that again. The the chroma key was awful. And then the other Canadian show was. I'm trying to remember it. It was a a bun, It was a giant bug ship. Uh, with a, with a oh. caretaker on it and a hot blonde girl. Yeah, I don't. Why am I drawing a blank on that? Hot Canadian that, hot. Blonde. That was neat. That was a very neat. And then it kind of got too weird, but I really enjoyed it. That was a that was a good show. By Someone... the way, I just want to point out that Sylvain Saint Laurent just sent a tip, a hundred dollar tip in to this channel and said it's going to be a great show. Wow, merci! Wow, that's uh, very nice of you, Sylvain. Thank you so much. By the way, the yeah. tip the tip link and super chats are open. So if you have any questions for Paul, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, Just put the money in my G string. Yeah, there you go. Dance, dance. <laughs> Actually, the best strip clubs I've ever been to are in Canada. <laughs> oh, I, I won't and, get into that. And, and um, that's all part of going to Winnipeg and selling our movie. Well, which... Flash Dance was based on a strip club in Toronto called Gimlets. Oh, I didn't know that. Is that true? Yep. Yep. And yep. isn't there a bar? It's it's not Shakespeare's, but there's like a bar, something like that. That's a, f a guy I used to work with talked about this bar that he went to all the time, and I don't know the name of it. I I, I always thought well, of it. There's tons. There were tons of bars. There's still yeah. are. I mean, the library was one that we went to in Ryerson. Gimlet's was an interesting strip club. It wasn't far from where Second City actually was here in Toronto, on Lombard. Uh it was um, a strip club, a strip bar where uh, the girls did not completely undress. They right. kept top and bottoms, and it was a place, this is weird to say, um, women, girls who wanted to finance their way through U of T would would come, and they were, you know, the bouncers were there, uh, people were quite safe and felt safe, and it wasn't that, so it's like someone went up in their bikini and danced. Yeah, yeah. well, you want to hear something crazy? Flash dance. In their bikini. Flashdance turns 40 this year. 
Wow. And they are re-releasing it uh, in April for a brief theatrical run, and then they're releasing a new 4K disc. I can't believe wow. that Flashdance is 40. Nice. And not very saggy either. I, I can give them credit that they... <laughs> They've kept in good shape. No, it's it's. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm telling you all sorts of uh, all sorts of Toronto lore. Oh my God, Lombard Street and Second City. I mean, that's another story to be able to see Dan Aykroyd and Catherine O'Hara and see all these people. Uh, you know, because I was studying down there and and I couldn't afford to go. So the Second City had this rule where uh, in the evening, once the audience left. Uh, you would line up for the improv part of the evening right. and you'd get in for free. <laughs> and I would get go down there every single every single time. I mean, it was just what a time. Uh, I well I'll so tell you great. Before we get into that, Irene Jobson sends in a super chat. And now Irene, you brought up this. Uh Paul, what is the most erotic thing that's happened to you or around you while working or away on work? Wow. Um, well, I mean, am I able to swear on on this stream? Or Fuck you yeah, you can. So, so uh, with the frantics, um, at the very beginning, you get any job that you can. First get. of all, explain, oh, set up, tell sorry. tell the folks at home what the frantics are. So, the frantics is a comedy troupe that got fairly well known. We had yeah. a radio series here in Canada. Uh, uh, we had ratings of 500,000 people listening to us every Saturday morning, which is huge. Huge. And uh, we did that for 10 years and had a TV show, short-lived TV show that unfortunately got canceled. But, you know, we're well known for Mr. Canoe Head and we became very famous in the United States through Dr. Demento through Boot to the Head. That's where I first heard of the frantics. Right. I was a fanatical Dr. Demento listener. He's, was, he was and continues to be one of the nicest people on the planet. Yeah. So he promoted us, and, and we actually won two years in a row for our Boot to the Head sketch on, on his uh, show. We're on his, many of his compilation albums. Yep. So we were a thing in Canada, not so much in the United States, but our show was on Showtime. Uh, and, um, and, and so, you know, as you start, your entertainment career, you're doing whatever it is that you can do to get started. I mean, if you knew what you were getting into when you got into it, you'd probably never would get into it. <laughs> right? It's a ton of hard work and naivety and stupidity is a very important part of being in show business. Because if you don't have that, then you, you'll, you'll never keep going. <laughs> were you Anyways, always looking to get into show business or yes. you yes. always since yes. you were a kid? I, I listened to the goon shows. I found the goon shows when I was a young kid a youngster and I would listen to the goon shows on chum radio. And then from that moment on, it was just like, I, I could not think of doing anything else, but were your parents comedy. supportive? No. <laughs> Hungarian Jewish president parents. Oh, yeah, what no. are you doing? You're <laughs> killing me. I'm very going to university. You're not going to go to that stupid college. I couldn't even go to a college. Had to be a university. <laughs> Did they ever come around? No. Uh, yes. When you were on TV it, or no, radio? No, no, no. When they heard a very famous Canadian stand-up, David Broadfoot, hugely funny guy, older gent, he's dead now, but very famous in Canada. My mom heard David Broadfoot on CBC when they said, so what are one of some of the up-and-coming acts? And he said, uh, beyond a doubt, the number one act is the Frantics. They are, they're going to be huge. Wow. And then my mother approached me and said, Paul, maybe you're doing something okay, but I'm so worried about you. I mean, people are mean in, in the show business. <laughs> so, And my dad once saw us when I was just a two-man comedy group with Rick Green, of R Red Green fame, if you are uh, PBS watchers. Um, and he saw one of our shows that was not very good because we did it in front of a bunch of lesbian poets that just did poetry about their vaginas it was all uh, one of, of my film professors in college was was a famous lesbian filmmaker and she made a movie that was like that which i actually admired i thought was pretty good that's it's a preoccupation they were all wearing uh, black uh, jumpsuits with the berets it was very it was very funny and um the one fat blonde one in the middle howled at us loved us the other ones not so much. Anyway, <laughs> dad, dad came up and he went, um, Paul, 
do you know Alan King? Maybe you can give him a call and he can give you tips. <laughs> the Alan King. Oh, Alan King. Wow. I mean, what an old stand-up to pull out of your hat. So most of your listeners won't even know who Alan King is. He did horrible sexist uh, uh, wife jokes. Anyway, but he's in, he was in a lot of movies, though, you know, as a character Alan, actor. No, I don't think he did a lot of movies. Did a few, didn't he? Not that I'm aware of. Oh, well, then maybe. maybe I'm wrong. I, I, maybe yeah. I'm thinking of that other Alan King. Maybe. So, so, anyways, we would open for Rock Axe, and and uh, we were okay. I mean, we had to use, you know, material which was quite naughty <laughs> to right. be able to, to to do it as we opened for these these heavy metal bands. And w uh, one time, and these are shitty bands, but it didn't matter how shitty you were. There was always groupies who wanted to come in and meet the band and one time a bunch of groupies came up and the drummer went by and and uh, they literally said fuck me fuck me to the um band member and i turned to them he said hey i was a member of the comedy group that opened up and they went fuck you <laughs> wow so there's the closest i ever got to groupies um alan king was uh he was in Casino, the, the Alan King I'm thinking ah. of. And uh, he wasn't in that many movies, but he was a character actor. And uh, he he was the guy that when 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 Robert De Niro was trying to, trying to get his license to work in the casinos, Alan King tells him that. So he was a he was a character actor. Yes, I, I, I heard he had good good press on that <laughs> role. He was great. Uh, that's what I was thinking of. So I don't know your Alan King. So that's pretty good. So Irene, Irene, uh, she is our resident. Uh, uh, she loves erotic stories. She loves dirty talk. Oh. <laughs> and, but, but she's married, and uh, she asks that's questions. Okay. She's a great uh, member of the channel. So um, now I want to, you know, I wanted to ask you. So you you were a performer. How did you become a network executive? So what happened was that our television show got canceled and that was pretty much a, a blow uh, uh cinema in in canada to this day is a no-go really there's there's not much you can do television was really the the pinnacle of of uh entertainment that you could reach in in canada at the time and comedy yeah. though was always big i mean you had what kids in the hall and sctv oh, yeah. and oh, so you the, guys always had a rich legacy of televised sketch great comedy sketch comedy terrible sitcoms Oh well. So so what happened was that um the Frantics decided that we would um we did we had one a new show written called The Frantics Walk Upright, a journey through history, where we compressed the entire world's history from the beginning of of humanity to um uh, uh to the to the very end at the time. Oh, I would and love to have seen that. It's on our, it's on, uh, if you go to uh, the Frantics channel on YouTube. Oh, okay. Got, okay, oh, okay. Fantastic. It's well written, well performed. It was the best show we ever did. We ran it for a couple of months. It was a huge hit. And then after that, I decided that was it. Let's go out in style. The guys were kind of mad at me. Sure. And after 10 years, though, I wanted to do things. And then what happened was the head of uh, uh, English, uh, the, 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 the person in charge of programming at the time, Yvonne Fitzsand, said, hey, you want to join the CBC? And I said yes, and I got to work with Spitting Image. and Really? Tried to, yep, tried to uh, get a whole bunch of... I wrote for Spitting Image, and um, I tried to get... Uh, my goal was, because we were so bad at sitcoms, I went to L.A. <laughs> to study with Canadian expats, like Stan Daniels and... Wow. You know, and Bert Metcalf was a Canadian from Saskatchewan. He directed half of the mashes. So I I I sat at the feet of some of the really well-known Canadians in LA. They took me to the directors um cine, you know the the dub, not the WGA, the directors guild or whatever. Yeah, the DGA. The DGA have their own little theater. I saw early Spielberg stuff. Uh, Bert Metcalf was just a darling. He came up and directed a bunch of episodes for a show that didn't work. So <laughs> the thing is, we got a little bit closer, but we never really could get it to work. But we, we, you know, we gave it a best shot. A lot of the writers went off to L.A. So, uh, right, you know, that was 
that was the legacy. We, I tried my best, did that for three years, and then interviewed for a job in, in Paramount. Um, and, uh, and then that night, I was at the Polo Lounge with a Canadian expat who did many reality shows for NBC. And all he could do was complain about the fact that he made NBC hundreds of millions of dollars and they weren't, weren't returning his phone calls. And uh, so I was you know, wondering what was happening with my interview at Paramount for a VP of VP development role, lots of money. And um, Cher came in and I was right at the door and I kind of saw her and she startled me and I startled her and I said in way too loud a voice, because I'm I've got a big voice, and I for whatever reason I went, Oh hi, Cher, in way too friendly a way. And I could tell as she looked at me, went, Do I know this fucker? Right. And she went, rather than embarrass herself for me, she went, Hi, so good to see you. And she put her hand on my shoulder, and then she said, Listen. You know, one day we can get together. I went, yeah, sure. And then she walked to her table. <laughs> so what happened was super important. She bestowed a bit of her aura on me. All eyes at the bar suddenly went to me. <laughs> People came by, obviously, that I didn't know, giving me cards. We got a talk. I felt dirty. I really? You didn't go I, with yeah. it? No, I hated it. Because you're Canadian. I hated it so much that when I went back to my hotel at the Beverly Hills, I phoned up Air Canada and said, I want to book the Red Eye tonight. I'm going home. And then I I never went back, did not uh, return Paramount's phone calls. And I uh, started a new media computer uh, business in uh, 1991 with my friend. And we were one of the originators of uh, new media. In, in Canada. Wow. I, then I went back to my computer side where I programmed. I could program and do stuff. I, it, You know what? I had seen the player, Robert Altman's player, and I went, I'm going to lose my soul here. That Cher was also in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't think I can do it. Or if I'm going to do it, I'm going to lose myself. That is, you know, that's a very... I quit. I quit on the spot. It's just very interesting. You know, in a way, people have asked me to uh, – I've been working now. This year is my 34th year wow. working professionally in the industry. And I've had a great time. But I've never had any major success in terms of financial or powerful, making a movie that made $200 million. I've never had any of that. But I continue to have a great time. Did you, did you want that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know what I want to do? I love making movies. I love the mm -hmm. process of making movies from their inception. Yes. I love post-production. You know, yes. I, 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 actually, the first movie I ever edited was, um, actually, uh, it, Bob Clark, uh, oh, he Canadian. made, who made a Christmas story. I, and the first, yeah, I work with Peter Billingsley. Don't shoot your eye out. The lead of a Christmas story. He and I. Uh, edited a movie called Arcade, and that was my first 30 years ago. It was a full moon movie directed by Albert Pune. And, you know, I, I've loved it. was a movie that was unreleasable that sat on a shelf. And we were tasked wow. with, with re editing the film. And my friend was, what was going to happen was they were going to just make new effects and drop them in. It was from Full Moon, the same company that made the subspecies movies and the Doll Man movies oh, and the yeah, yeah. Puppet Master. And uh, it was interesting because. I called my friend up who was supposed to put this movie back together and Peter was in it and he was one of the he was the original assistant editor and I we looked at the movie and I said to my friend Dan I go Dan you know this movie was edited originally in like 7 days there's a much better movie here uh than just dropping in new effects and I said to him I go can we recut the movie and he said and I had been working as a PA and I'd been working in makeup effects and he goes yeah but what do you what do you know about editing movies and I said, well, I got an A in editing at USC. <laughs> and 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 he literally, he said, really? And and I was able to convince him and sort of explain. And they went to Charlie Band, the, who went to, who would produce like Reanimator and From Beyond. And they he was our boss. And he said, look, I'll let you guys, I'll pay for the edit bay. 
and you give me 10 minutes of your recut to show oh. me what you can do. And then there was a, we were using a Canadian visual effects company, and this is circa 92, 93. Okay. And it was a company called DHD Post Image, and I want to say it was in Montreal. And DHD Post Image was doing these effects that we were dropping in. And so we recut, Peter Billingsley and I recut the first 10 minutes and showed it to Charlie. And he's like, this is great. And and John Delancey Q was in it. Seth Green was in it. Wow. Um, yeah. Megan Ward was in it. Okay. And Peter and Peter was in it. So when he looked at it, he said, okay. But now we were editing this on a three-quarter inch system. Okay. Cutting on three-quarter inch tape. Yep. So it was linear. And it was it was. Terrible. I still have my three quarter inch deck here. It's just behind. Does this it monitor. work? Yep. Because whenever I've still got tapes, whenever I need one, I have to. There's a great place that'll rent them. You can rent the de the decks out. But it. We spent six months editing this movie, and uh, I learned everything I needed to know about editing a feature, and then uh, and then doing. Um. Um. Uh, wow! Wow! And and you got a is that a digi beta deck too, or is both three quarter? It's an analog beta. Analog beta, um, yeah. That those you don't see much of those anymore. No, no. But um, um, it, it it was it was a really interesting experience. So through the mid '90s, I specialized in editing first time directors' features, and I learned the Avid oh, early nice. on. And so uh, you know, I I learned the Avid when I was working for a uh, I worked in network promos and okay. things like that. So that's where I learned the Avid when it was brand new. Learned nonlinear editing back mm -hmm. in like 95 and it was a lot of fun and I loved what I did I loved post-production I loved working with first-time directors and sort of feeding off their energy but I never parlayed it like the the direct the editor of uh, a lot of the Marvel movies started out the same way and I right. just but I liked to do too many different things so if I had specialized in editing I'd probably be editing A-list features now but I also wanted to make movies. I made music yep. videos, and I was a big fanboy too. So when I had an opportunity to work on the Star Trek experience, the eighty million dollar thing they were building in Vegas, I had made this uh, this montage. I had one day on this Avid system, and I cut this Star Trek montage together just for the in '96 for the anniversary, just for fun and for this award show. And it ended up getting me a job on the Star Trek experience, and Paramount bought the tape from me to promote the 30th anniversary of Star Trek and had me re-edit, which led to a nice. job. I was a Star Trek consultant nice. for Viacom licensing yep. for a while, which seems funny to say now, but but I was. But I, I you know, I never I, I never specialized. Because you know how everybody wants to know, well, what is sure. it you do? But I liked and I like being able to go to Comic Con and be a pundit and and speak. And I've had a lot of fun, but I haven't been able to make the movies that I've wanted to make. Uh, Hollywood does not like generalists. No, no. And and I would have it, you know, no other way. And the thing about YouTube, that's why I wanted to talk to you about getting onto yeah. YouTube is like, to me, it feels like a 24 seven sci-fi convention. And when the internet was rising, I mean, I was on AOL chat boards talking mm -hmm. about Star Trek in 92 and 93 and 94. Comp Comp oh, you, so you predate AOL. We, cause Comp oh, it's the same. Was it the uh, same? Maybe a little, and then there was the well, the whole Earth electronic link. Yeah, that, that was, I wasn't there. Yeah, that was too. But it was like I didn't know my first experience with with when I was at USC in '88. My roommate John Parkan at the time he says I'm gonna. This is in '88. He goes, I'm gonna set up a BBS. <laughs> I'm, I'm what I was like. What is that? And he goes, It's a bulletin board service. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know what that is. He goes, well, I'm gonna set up a a server. And it's gonna. And it was on our dining room table. It's gonna be a computer, and and people can log in, and I'll, it'll be a Star Trek BBS. And I'm like, what What does that mean? He goes, Well, people could just log in, and you could talk about Star Trek on the computer. Yep. And I'm like, I had no. I'm like, really? And he goes, Yeah. And I go, Well, who are these people? He goes, You're not gonna know. They're just random people that want to talk about Star Trek, yep. and it could take like twenty calls. I think 20 different people could come on at a time and they had to even know what was there. And I, I was blown away by this. I sat yep. whenever I came home, I was on that Star Trek BBS board oh. discussing the minutia of Star Trek. And then it got much better when you got to the AOL chat boards, but like Ron Moore who wrote for next generation, co-created Battlestar Galactica and, 
uh, he was he would go on to AOL chat boards. You know, and, I, and- I I set up a, a a first class BBS for 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 which for the show or the, oh, the- or uh, macromedia director programmers. Wow. Oh my god, macromedia director. I loved Macromedia Director. I, I was I that was my programmer programming of choice. Wow. Now I should mention I still have our sixty thousand dollar avid Mac editor in the other in the furnace room. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Like I think about the first avid that I ever bought was in two thousand and four for we, when we were working on Chronicles of Narnia. And the whole system and the drives was seventy five thousand dollars. And and you you had to conform to tape. You, yeah. The the font you could edit these crappy QuickTime, um, uh, in QuickTime, but you had to con the final conform always had to be to tape. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and then, then also I was making negative cut lists and stuff on, on the Avid. So oh you, yeah. So that was that was something that I had learned early on. So for those of the the, the people uh, out out in the world watching this right now, so when you were editing nonlinearly digitally, when you were finishing on film, you had to make sure that all the numbers conformed yep. to the negative that was shot. Yep. And there were three different numbers. You had what were called flex files. You had the key code numbers that were on the side of the film itself. You had the audio time code, which conformed to the actual production audio that was recorded on set and then you had the video time code of the actual tape that your film had been telecinied onto and all of that stuff had to be correct if you were if the numbers were not right everything you'd edited in the computer wouldn't make any difference because it wouldn't match back to the original oh the good old days and so we oh. still haven't gotten to to trek to to shatner yet we, I know. We, we have. <laughs> I love this. This is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, so well, I'll tell you what. What? So I'm. This is a very funny thing. So I'm working on the start. I was literally hired to cut all of the videos that you would see at this eighty million dollar Star Trek attraction in Vegas wow. at the Hart Hilton. So you'd go through this Star Trek museum, and they had original props and recreations. And then there was the ride thing. You got beamed up. It was very, it was very cool. The whole thing was very cool, very immersive, better than even like Rise of the Resistance at Disney. Now I know people are going what, but so I'm working on this, and so I had to cut videos. Like here's a video about the Romulans, and here's a video about the Klingons. So before I could edit the videos, I had to ingest all of Star Trek up to that point into the computer because you had, and it, it happened in real time. So I spent five months being paid, I don't know, $1,800 a week. And nice. all I did was watch Star Trek. Nice. I literally started where I put the tapes in, <laughs> digitized them for the original series, 52 minutes. And I would try and do like 10 episodes a day if I could. That would be my work day because then I was just I couldn't watch any more Star Trek. So I literally started. So it was all of the original series, all of the next generation. It was Deep Space Nine for the first three years. Right. And the first season of Voyager. And we didn't use the animated series. And that's what I did for two years. <laughs> it was the greatest job in the world. I think that's great. And so while I'm doing it, I had made my magnum opus, which was a five minute video about the original series it had every time dr mccoy said i'm a doctor not a moon shuttle conductor it had every planet it had every creature it had every woman kirk kissed it had every uh, punch he threw and it was this five minute magnum opus uh montage of star trek history with famous lines in it and i at the same time i had edited a film uh, called the Asphalt Quartet. It's terrible. It's, you can't find it. Um, and I'd finished that, and the the producer said, "What? What? What do you want to make? You want to make a movie?" And I had directed a film, and I I decided I had this idea. I wanted to make the ultimate Jewish horror movie, and the movie uh, it was going to be called Day of Atonement. <laughs> and, and it was it was it was all about it. All, it took all these Yiddish folk tales, like uh, about Asmodeus and Lilith and the Lamed Vav and the the Golem. righteous men and all the all that stuff. 
And the producer, this guy, Mort Salkine, is like, that sounds great, because he was Jewish. <laughs> this, he was like a Jewish gangster from New Jersey, businessman. He was, he was awesome. And he goes, that sounds great. And so I recruited my friend Mark Altman, who I ended up making Free Enterprise with, who had been publishing a magazine called Sci-Fi Universe that I was writing for. And so that's what we were doing. We had to turn in that script, and it was truly awful. The Uh-oh. script we had written was truly awful. We, we had all these different ideas in it. There was a cool movie in there somewhere, but it was terrible. So I get this, my magnum opus back from Rick Berman's office, who was producing the Star Trek franchise. And the only note was, it said, there's too much original series in this. And and because the, the, the attraction was a next generation themed attraction. Okay. And it was on the Enterprise D, and but it was, it was for the Star Trek Museum. I'm like... What does he care? And I was so angry about it. I, w- I was telling Mark about this, and and um, uh, and we were talking about Day of Atonement. We, I, I'm like, we can't turn this script in. The script is not our best work. And and Mark says, what if we made a movie about like ourselves and our obsession with Star Trek and made it like like Swingers had recently come out that John Favreau and and uh, Vince Vaughn had made? What if we made that? Hmm. And I'm like, I-, I don't know what that even would be. And, and he goes, well, let me try writing something. And so he calls me back the next day and he reads this scene that I had told him when I got beat up in junior high school the day Star Trek The Motion Picture opened and I went to school wearing a Starfleet uniform, sciences, blue uniform. And, but in the, in the scene, I don't just get beat up. William Shatner appears to me and gives me advice. He goes, you know, kick the little fucker's ass. And, and I'm reading this going, this is hilarious. That's, and, that's and almost play it again, Sam. Yeah, that it was that's exactly what it was. The we we it was played against Sam was our touchstone. It was Woody Allen's played against Sam nice. by way of Kevin Smith and the movie Swingers. Nice. So we wrote this and presented it, and the powers that be said, Oh my god, we would we're gonna make this movie. And we just figured that William Shatner would be in this movie because he's playing himself. And in the original conception of the movie, Shatner appears as an imaginary. It's funny because I I have something I can show you. I didn't realize it was sitting right here, but Shatner was an imaginary friend. And he was like, he would show up as the martini swilling playboy yeah. at night, Hepcat with a, in the bathroom. He was Hugh Hefner by way of James Coburn in the Iron Man Flint movie. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, that's kind of how we wrote him. And we just figured, of course, of course he's going to do this movie. You know, like, why wouldn't he? And we had the m- money to make it. We had, you know, the, the, we shot the movie for a little over $600,000. It's like a million dollar movie. We had the money to make the movie, and the first person we cast was Eric McCormack, yeah, another Canadian. good Canadian who also went to Stratford. Stratford's a, a an acting; it's very famous. Shakespearean actors come out of their Canadian school, and the thing was, we started casting, and we had no Shatner. And for months, we we're like in pre-production and casting, and we couldn't get the script to Shatner. Nobody would; we couldn't it was, for whatever reason. We tried to get it to him. Then we started writing him these like tear stained letters, you know. To him personally, well, you can't get past his agent. Yeah, we were trying to do. We, his, we found out who his agent was, you know, his manager, business manager, Larry Thompson, who I actually like very much. Couldn't get to him. And then one day, right before Christmas, this is Christmas of 1997, Shatner called me up, and at first I'm like, I've never spoken to William Shatner at this point in my life. He's just my hero. And uh, he's on the phone, and I get Mark, and I'm like, "Oh my God, you're so William Shatner!" <laughs> I, I can't believe it. And and uh, he's 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 on the phone, and and I'm like, oh, "Mr. Shatner," he's like, "No, no, no, call me Bill, Bill." And we have this conversation, and he says to us, "He goes, look, you know, you've written this script um, with me in it, and it's very funny. I really like your script, but you've you've essentially written me as God." Like I show up and I give wise pearls to, uh, to these kids and and they think I they worship the ground I walk on. He's like, I can't be in this movie. Like I, I'd be laughed out of Hollywood. And the funny thing, Mark and I are thinking to ourselves, but you are God. You know, <laughs> like what are you talking? You know, we're like, he's God to us, and and how can this be? And um, 
so he 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 says, listen, I understand. You know, I've been there. You've raised money for a movie, but I just, I just can't, I can't do it. And then we, we're both of us, Mark and I, are like, well, wait a minute. Is there anything that you could do, or anything we could do, that might make you reconsider? And he goes, well. You know, I, I suppose that if you were to maybe rewrite your script, and he goes, I'm not saying if you rewrite your script, I'm going to be in your movie because of the boxing right. Helena suit with uh, with Kim Basinger and how she was promising to be in Jennifer Lynch's movie and then fell out. He's like, I don't want that to happen. So I'm not promising him to be in your movie. But if you were to rewrite the script and make me like a normal guy, you know, give me foibles, problems. And we're like, what problems do you have? He's like women i've been married three times you know i got daughters <laughs> we're just like he's going on and on. and we're like really because <laughs> you know we don't we don't know what he's got so we're like okay and then um we rewrote the script and the idea it went from being played against sam to my favorite year the peter o'toole okay. movie so uh about an icon with feet of clay essentially and we wrote we wrote, uh, unfortunately, our tightly, our tightly structured script became a little loosey goosey, and so the romantic uh, rom com element and the Shatner element did not dovetail anymore. It was like two different, and this is still in yeah. the final film. So th yeah, we I were never that. able because we didn't have the time. We had to start working. So we worked over Christmas, and. We sent him the script. Now, it's very funny that I sent him the script, and uh, then he sent he sent me this actually, this is the actual thing. I'll, 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 I'll cover the address. I don't live here anymore, but uh, this is the actual thing that came from William Shatner nice. after he read our script. And what was very interesting about it is, and this is, I thought, the funniest thing. First of all, it came with this eight by ten, <laughs> with the toupee. Yeah, which I thought was the greatest eight by ten I've ever seen in my life, and that's why I've kept it. That's 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 quite the muskrat he's got on his head. And um, it came again. Here is this letter, signed by William Shatner. It's his autograph. It is dated January 9th, nineteen ninety eight. Dear Mark and Rob, thanks for sending me your rewritten script. It seems to me you have a very funny movie, but I still feel the same way. I simply can't bring myself to play myself in a movie. It's just too much. It has nothing to do with the quality of your script. It has to do with the concept of Shatner on Shatner. I appreciate your efforts, and I hope that the future will offer us another opportunity. Well, in less than three weeks, we were shooting the movie with Shatner starring. Basically, this was a negotiating tactic, and uh, we were wow. able to come to a um, come to an accommodation, and we nice. were able we were able to get him to work for five days on the film, and uh, one of those days was a sixteen hour day. For those of you who know, that's overtime; it's expensive, but we yep. planned it. It was pre planned that it was because we only had this location for um, for one day. Actually, we had it for a day and a half. So we got to make this movie. And I, I did say I brought a clip to show. Yeah. So the clip from this movie, uh, this is when Eric McCormack, Will from Will and & Grace, and Rafer Weigel are in a real bookstore. It's moved since then, called the Iliad Bookstore, which used to be right next to Odyssey yeah. Video. Yeah. And um, this is the scene where they meet. And it's coming off of a scene where Robert uh, crashed his car, the character of Robert crashed his car, because he was going down on his girlfriend while he was driving, which is not something I recommend doing. And, and uh, Shatner is in a very special section of the store. Yeah, he's, he's well, he's just found, yeah, he's found, what's, okay, what's funny about that is, so. I won't give it away. Well, no, so Mark and I worked, we worked, Sci-Fi Universe Magazine was published by Larry Flint. Yeah, okay, and yes. so we were able to get our favorite Larry Flint porn mags, and Chic was one of our favorites. And for whatever random reason, this is the funny thing about this scene, 
why Shatner was able to find a chic magazine in the Iliad bookstore, we never explain it. They don't have a porn section. We just thought it would be funny to get Shatner to oh, yeah, read a good. porn magazine. So here is the and scene. And good for him. I, I, that was, I, you have two shocks in that movie, which that was one of them. I'll, I'll show you a clip and then I'll tell you what the second shock was. Uh, okay, here you go. Listen, when I'm with a woman, I know that I'm going to climax. I mean, it's not even an issue. You know, all guys come. I'm more interested in participating in my partner's orgasm. You know, women become oh, you, very, yeah, you, very spiritual oh. before orgasms. Oh, my God. Besides, as I was led to believe, ladies first. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Right, that's exactly what they say. I don't believe it. It's Bill. Okay, just be cool. Don't stare. He'll go blind. And he's perusing porno. All right. I got to go over there and talk to him, man. What do what you, you know? All around the world, from as far off as the Caspian Sea, people have been running up to Bill and acting like idiots. Why must you be one of them? Because now it's my turn. I mean, don't you want to go over there and talk to him and see what he's like? I mean, William Shatner made us who we are today. But do, do you want to insult the man? Just respect his space. I do respect his space. It's the final frontier. Oh, just, just be dignified, you know? Don't do anything stupid. All right. Calm, cool, and collected. Don't make a big scene. Oh, good. I've been looking for Mein Kampf. Uh, uh, sir, I just... Uh, Mr. Shatner, I would like to say that I think you are the greatest American actor ever. I'm a Canadian. Well, then, may I just say that you are the greatest Canadian actor ever. <laughs> there aren't that many of them. Well, if I may, sir, just say that I have a tremendous amount of respect for your work as a writer, a director, a thespian, and an entrepreneur. Thank you. L listen, um, I, 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 we don't want an autograph or anything like that. I, I was just wondering, um, what brings you here? Um, I'm trying to find something to read. You, you, you buy books? Otherwise, it'd be shoplifting. <laughs> Listen, I'm sorry. We, we, we don't want, we're, we're not, we, we were just wondering if we could, maybe we could buy you a drink or something. I mean, we're really, we're not the usual kooky fans. Oh, no. Right. We can... We just, uh, we couldn't help but sense that there's something wrong. Are you, uh, you perturbed about something? Uh, yes, I am. If it'll, uh, stop you from following me around, uh, I'm having uh, trouble with the story I'm writing, okay? I sense that. It's, that's the worst. I get the same thing myself. Are you a writer? Yes, actually. No, are oh, you yeah. really? Is that yeah. block the worst thing? Absolutely. Just, oh, we discuss yeah. it all the time. can't do anything. We're actually both uh, industry professionals. Uh -huh. Yeah, I work over really? at, uh, at uh, Fully Clips. Really? Yeah. Are you, uh, are you uh, a higher up? A big muckety-muck? Uh, well, I mean, I, I just uh, directed um, a little thing. It's called Beach Babe Bimbo. Uh, no, I, you know, it's funny. I was over there this morning pitching my latest opus, Brady Killer, and... Uh, Looks like it's going to be a go problem. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. That's yeah. great. That's great. I've got an idea, you know. And so there you go. <clears throat> great um, scene. Good start to the movie. Yeah, I mean, it was fun. It was fun to do that. I mean, it was really hard. Obviously, we were running, gunning the whole time. I didn't realize we had almost 50 locations in 24 days. A company Who's moves every DLP? day. Um, the DOP was a guy named Chuck Barbie, Look and great. what was really I interesting, he he had shot a movie that uh, I had edited. A guy named Michael Nash directed it called Nebraska. That no one's ever again, no one's ever seen it. But I loved his photography, and I told him, I said when I was editing the film, I said, "Dude, you you are going to you've got to shoot my movie." 
And what's interesting is Chuck Barbie used to work for Douglas Trumbull, the visual effects okay. artist. And he worked on, like, he made a documentary on the making of Trumbull's film Silent Running. Mm. And then he had he had been a an effects photographer on Star Trek the Motion Picture. And um that which was all very cool. So he shot Free Enterprise and you know, we shot it with all prime lenses and uh we used vision vi yeah, vision stocks, really colorful. Um sometimes the focus is is not as good as I would have liked because that wasn't his fault, you know, but um it was uh I think the movie looks it has a very interesting look to it. Using all primes and then the, those colored vision stocks were so the colors I told I told Chuck, I said, these characters live in a world of a slightly heightened reality. They see themselves and the world around them as, as in a way, not rose-colored glasses, but technicolor glasses. They Everywhere they go, it's mm. slightly more heightened than real. And uh, he really captured that. So It, it looks great. And, you know, the, the, the first place, I'll tell you the story... So there was a film festival in Canada called the Local Heroes Film Festival. And it was in it, the year we were there, which was 98. It was split between Edmonton and Winnipeg. Oh. Now, we only, I know, right? That's we, a big distance. Uh, well, we, it was, but it was in, one was in, in 98, and then in 99, it was in Winnipeg, I oh, want to say okay. in February. Oh, nice! You know, and I'd never perfect been to Winnipeg. To be, perfect time to be in in Winnipeg, in man. And so, w what was really cool in Edmonton? It Minus was playing 40. with Arthur Hiller's movie, The Americanization of Emily, which okay. stars James Garner and and I, Julie. I never saw it, but I heard it's a great it. movie. But he was there, so Arthur Hiller, we got to see, we got to meet him, and wow. Free Enterprise was on the on the bill with that movie, which is an honor. But then, in we saw we showed the movie. We won a bunch of awards, but we hadn't sold it. No one wanted to buy it, which we thought what? was Why odd. Not? People, it's too weird, I guess. And in when we were at Winnipeg, Winnipeg at the time had, I guess, the first openly gay mayor of a Canadian town, and he was okay. the mayor of of Winnipeg. And I said, he's going to have this huge party for the film festival at his house, and I said, I said, dude. Gay men throw the best parties. We have to stay. We don't just want to show our movie and leave. We've got to like stay here. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a blowout. It's it's the dead of winter. It's I'd never been a place that was so cold that the <laughs> grains of of snow turn into like sand and it's all dry and it it has this great. I still want to make a horror film in Winnipeg in the middle of winter. <laughs> uh, do what Guy Madden, another great Canadian yes, filmmaker, another great Canadian. Yeah, yeah. And so we did. We went to this party, and these guys. Um, approached us from uh region entertainment and they were like how come your movie and they were at the, the the screening in winnipeg and it blew the roof off the place and they're like how come your movie hasn't been picked up for distribution we're like i don't know we can't get anybody to watch it and he's like that's the problem if you come and see it with the real audience i didn't know that they were even there they're like we want to acquire your film wow so we were at the mayor of winnipeg's party and we met the distributors that picked up our movie for distribution. Nice. So Canadians, not Woo! only did it have good Canadians in it, it was a Canadian, you know, a Canadian event that sold the film. I'll I'll tell you a real. Uh, I was really impressed, and I don't know where it came from, but the turnaround where Shatner turns out to be this needy. Hollywood star that wants to sell a script and then the two guys uh just can't get away from him fast enough. Yeah, well that that's was that's great. the continuum. And I give him credit. I give Shatner credit for playing oh what a what a wretched character. <laughs> he well I'll tell you he was before we wrote when we had to rewrite the script, we watched every comedic appearance he'd been in. Okay. Whether it's Saturday Night Live or Fridays, Airplane Two, and he has a tendency to go over the top. You know, he likes to he likes broad humor. That's kind of his thing, and that wouldn't have worked because we had to write him. And I my one direction to Shatner, my biggest direction to him was I said, listen, um, the people that watch this movie have to wonder at any time when they're watching this movie, are you serious, or are you just out of your mind?
And and he goes, oh, I get that. I get that. And and when he's explaining this, when he does that, he explains oh. he's going to do a one-man version of Julius Caesar. He's going to oh. play all the parts. I mean, oh. we were dot when he was explaining that we were we were dying, and yes. and one of my favorite uh, scenes in the movie. And the thing about the thing about William Shatner is, to me, he's a take two guy. And the, when okay. I say that, because his take ones, the reason he talks like this is because he's thinking about his next line, right? And and also because he's a Shakespearean trained actor, and his first takes. Are, he's trying to figure out how to get through them, and but he does want to know like like you have to give him a reason to do a take two, and I was always and McCormick knew this, so he was always trying to figure out like how are you going to get him to do it again, and but when he would do it the second time, it was always comedy gold okay. because he was he was so and we revered him and and we were having he was so much fun. To work with, I had so that was, much. That was an amazing thing to do in the movie to to take uh, down his crown, his oh. halo, to remove the halo of William Shatner. Uh, and I give you credit and Shatner credit for not having the you know the ego to fight that. Oh. that I thought I thought that was uh, he. He, I was amazed at that. Yeah, he loved it, and and there's the there's one scene, and I I just wish that we had more. T- we had it was such an indie production. We were we were going so fast, I barely had time to block scenes because you know we sure. had it was really difficult, and you know we were shooting with prime lenses, which was even harder because of focus pulling and things like right. that. But but there was this one scene where where he's talking to one of the characters. They're playing pool, and and he stops and he goes. Listen, I know my idea is crazy. Six hours? You know, who's going to sit for this? One man show? It's ridiculous. It's the height of hubris. And then he says, but I think I can do it. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and that moment to me was the whole movie. Yeah, yeah, You yeah, know, yeah. it was a whole movie right then and there. And, and the thing was, we had no time to shoot it. So I said to Chuck, and they're, they're supposed to get drunk. And I said, look, they're drinking, they're hammered. I'm like, even if the focus is breathing, just put the camera on our steady cam, and and we'll just move in and out. We had like 20 minutes to shoot the whole thing, and I go, we're just gonna fill the fill up a mag, and we're gonna run the scene like three times from beginning to end, and all I need is that last moment, and I need it to be a 50 50, and as long as you can come up on them, and then I can punch in for that final close up. I mean, I need. The, the the movie is essentially be careful what you wish for. Yeah. When you when it re- relates to meeting your heroes, but in the end, he's proven that his cockamamie idea is viable. <laughs> so, you know, and and I, I, it was so much fun. It was it's the only movie I've directed. This is twenty five years ago. Yeah, and then, uh, and uh, how come you never directed another movie? Well, <laughs> it's so I needed money, you know, and it money, was, money is important. Uh, so after soon after I made that, I was I was editing. I was making my living as. But a, that movie did not give you any cred to anyone in Hollywood. Well, I was I got, I did did get an agent. I had good agents at William Morris. I was working for Bill Cosby, developing okay. a project for a while, but it was it was on spec. The biggest, the closest I ever came to my bite at the studio Apple, was the movie Dude, Where's My Car. Okay. Yep. And so that was really the only movie that I went in on. And it was between me and the guy who eventually directed it. And the original script for Dude, Where's My Car was a cross between Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke and Repo Man. Okay. And it was a total pro drug comedy, which in the early 2000s was not cool. You know, people. And I love the subversive sort of punk rock nature of the fact that these two characters were unapologetic stoners. Mm-hmm. And I loved it. I said, "I this is so great. It's subversive. And it, back then it was totally R-rated. And there were aliens in it. I'm like, this is right up my alley. And it was a huge budget. And it was a 20th Century Fox film. So it was a big deal for me. It, it would have made my career. I go in there Damn. and I, I walked in and it was one of those typical, it was a full big table of executives. And I had them in rapture. I was circling the table. My pitch slayed. My vision slayed. I was. I, I thought for sure I had the job. 
Next day, I get the phone call. My agent calls me up and goes, dude, you killed in that room. They loved you. But they've decided that the movie is going to be PG, and they're going to pull out the overt drug references from it. And since you came down so hard on the drug aspects of the film, I, they're going to go with the other guy. And I'm like, well, but that was that was the script they gave me. I mean, it was, I, I what? And it was so, to be honest. They didn't even give you a second chance. No. Because they liked you. Yeah. yeah, they, no. And there was, and that was the closest I came. And then the thing, what happened after that was I got a job at NBC cutting promos for the, uh, 2000 Sydney Olympics and it was a right. huge amount of money and they wanted me to go to other meetings and I'm just like I can't leave my job you know I was getting married and um I, I can't I I I need to make money and at the same time I was also working for a company DVD special features were getting huge and I went and as a DVD special feature I ended up a producer I worked on Lord of the Rings I worked on the X-Men movies and so during the aughts, I really had this great career um, working on these huge movies. And for a film geek like me, I mean, I'm in L New Zealand running around shooting them, shooting the miniatures of Min or the bigatures of Minas Tirith. I was having the greatest time in the world. I'm like, this is the greatest. Do I need to make another movie? You know, I had a really great job. I was working for, I was meeting, going, oh, this week I'm flying to London to go interview Christopher Lee. <laughs> you know, it was. Yeah. It, I mean, one one of the reasons I also left that um, meeting at the Polo Lounge was I was thinking about my wife and my life. Yeah. And being on the road with the Frantics, super hard on a relationship. And, uh, you know, I went back and uh, created a new media marketing programming company that was stable, got up to 15 employees, worked for Daimler Worldwide, uh, McDonald's. Had a lot of Fortune 500 companies made a lot of money, and I was able to retire. So, and all my acting friends with their ups and downs, which you've described, I, I'm not an up and down guy. I like taking risks, right? But and and now I'm back at 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 YouTube. So, I, I, a couple things. Number one, um, I use the Shatner technique. When I was in doing commercial auditions, and once I used the Shatner technique, I landed every single ad because <laughs> I would break up paragraphs and stop in the middle of sentences. <laughs> and and it was the quickest way to make people think I'm acting. I thought, wow, this was so rather than stopping at the end of sentences, I always stopped at the middle of the next sentence. That and then kept on talking. And and it was a quick quick way to make people wow this guy is really acting so i thought that was um i'll, I'll tell you was, another thing about shatner is he taught me a lesson which is one of the greatest lessons by the way i did go on to produce movies you know i produced i was a producer on the agent cody banks franchise like i okay. my partners i bought yeah. that script so we produced both of those movies and then i produced a horror film for warner brothers called the hills run red and most recently tango know. shalom uh that i also <laughs> edited so that that so i've stayed in the game but i just haven't directed anything and by the way nor have i tried so i haven't there's a couple of scripts that i've been working on for quite some time that i'm i'm actually going to actively pursue making now it's it's nerve-wracking directing i've directed i love um, it i mean i love i directed episodes of actually i directed five episodes of a skinamax show called femme fatales where we had to shoot these episodes in three days nice and it was brutal but it was a lot of, i'm proud of i'm no one will ever look at them and see my genius but it was fun to make and i i'm very proud of all the episodes i directed but you know, it's it's the Shatner thing. Shatner taught me something really interesting about acting and movie making. And the first day we we're shooting, we we're shooting on Wilshire Boulevard here in yeah. LA, the main yep. ridiculous. And it's his first day working, it's his first scene, and we're shooting on a sidewalk in the Miracle Mile district, so it's hugely busy. And everyone was nervous because it was Shatner. I certainly was nervous. And when he the first time we brought him out on the set, like we blocked. So for those of you who don't know, when you're making a TV show or movie, you block a scene where the actors, we you figure out how they're going to do it, 
and it allows the director of photography and the, the whole lighting crew to understand where they're going to have to go. And the first AD and you can confer and go, okay, I've, I see what you're going to do. Let's figure out our methodology. We're going to start here and go to here and come to here and come to here. And then you, you dismiss the actors once you've blocked and let them go to their trailer and relax or look at their lines. When you're ready to shoot, you bring them back. Yeah. So when we brought Shatner back, we were all still very nervous and we wanted it to be perfect. And when we actually brought him in, our, my director, Chuck Barbie, the director of photography, wanted to futz, wanted to change things around. And Shatner was ready to shoot. And Shatner took me aside. He wasn't a dick about it because it was his first shoot and he understood what we were doing and we treated him with great respect. And he said, Rob, just a bit of advice. He says, when you're ready... When you call me to set, I want to. I expect to be working. I don't want to come out on set when sure. they're still futzing around. He was totally cool about it, totally nice about it. And I said, Mr. Shatner, you know, he's like, Bill. I said, Bill, it'll never happen again. And and he said, yeah, because, and he, and he was very nice. He goes, look, when I come out here and we're going to shoot, that's us. That's we're working together. We're, we're making the movie. Yeah, and he's got a ton of experience by that time. Oh my God, he's directed Star Trek Five. He's been in right. a million different TV shows, and it was the best advice I've ever heard, both as a producer and as and I've made sure that you never call an actor after you've blocked. You never call an actor back to the set unless it's either for an effect shot. If you can get an effects played off early, um, hopefully not. But if you have to, bring him out and um, and un until you're ready. And it's it's worked for me ever since. And that was a great lesson I learned from William Shatner about directing and acting. So, but now let me ask you, with him now being 92 at the wow. end of the month, you know, how do you feel about William Shatner's legacy? What, what does he mean to pop culture? Well, the most important thing that he's done is actually had other successes since Star Trek. You don't have a legacy without other successes. So Boston, uh, legal. Yeah, Denny Crane. All those things. Two Emmys for that performance. Right. And it, it all maintains his Star Trek legacy. Because there's nothing sadder than just having the one thing. And when you have a variety, even T.J. Hooker, which people made fun of, was a well done show. Yeah. And he put everything into it i mean there was no holding back he didn't make he did not mail in his performance no um he was actually in a show a western show that didn't last with doug mcclure was that I the barbary remember. coast yes terrible show yeah it was bad that was right after but again he committed to it and um and what was i mean and he's had many successes since so but you also have to you know remember i mean he always like even his previous performances in twilight zone i mean the 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 guy on the plane with the i mean he has nightmare at twenty thousand feet yeah so the directed man, by the way by richard donner yes and and he's an iconic machine so he's had that captain kirk and and numerous other efforts like boston legal and that's why he's managed to maintain his legacy the man never stopped working no and an, another thing he's also never stopped he wrote books he's yes. an equestrian i mean he yep. rode horses he had a he loves he's a sportsman he loves he life off his horse in kentucky my brother was there buying um sperm he was also raised quarter horses yes he did my, and my brother was a chiropractor and he went up to shatner and said i can help you and he uh, he adjusted him right there so he could get up and and walk back to his seating area because he was in pain. So there you go. Well, that's I the mean, closest I've gotten through Shatner through my brother. So he's, blo he's blocked me online. <laughs> uh, I I, I'm I'm blocked by Shatner online too. It's his, you know, probably one of his assistants. Yeah, and I, I'm like I, I was pre-blocked by Paramount Plus. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was pre-blocked by them, which which is it's such a funny thing that that uh, uh, that it's it's. But yeah, one day, I mean, Shatner and I were actually we would we would go back and forth. The last exchange I had, we were talking online, or, or was people. I don't know if it was because of my involvement with Axon or it wasn't anything I said. 
it was probably somebody told them something and blocked me, which is such a weird thing because we were this close to getting Free Enterprise 2 made. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. yeah. So, but let me ask you this, you know, sure. with, with Paramount Plus putting an ad like this out, you know, we, we have an ad like this, you know, an entire universe to explore. And I, I get it. It's not necessarily current Star Trek, but even that doesn't hold. I mean, Kate Mulgrew is in Prodigy. Seven of Nine is in Picard, obviously, and everybody else is working. But Spock and Uhura are both no longer with us. Captain Archer's here. What do you think this says about Shatner's legacy? And you did a really interesting video. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about William Shatner and how people, like he is certainly not liked by some of the quote unquote woke establishment. No. And, and do you think that, that, that should, that people's personal feelings should, should, take a backseat to someone's legacy, especially Shatner, who has gone into space and who has done so many things and who has given so much of his time and, and, and life to his audience. Um, do you think that Paramount and CBS owe him anything? I, I, I think they're idiots. I don't know if they owe him anything, but to not include him is a massive insult. I think and, so. And, and ridiculous be beyond the point of ridicule it's it, I, I i can't imagine not including him I, you know whether it's on purpose whether he owns his own uh kirk visage and there's some legal implications uh to including him but to put berman in the middle and have the star trek logo pointing at her perhaps the very worst character in the history of, i'm sorry the, and by the, the way, that's no slide on Sneak with Martin Green because I think she did great work in no, Walking I have Dead nothing, and I'm talking beautiful about the lover. She's a stunning woman who was, uh, you know, a Berman God. Uh, everyone would, you know, pray. I don't want to go over it. I just hated the character. I, right, right, I, right. I hated the character beyond every fiber in my body. Me, I me too. It was terrible. And from the beginning, course, that character is in the begin is in the middle. And has the Star Trek symbol pointing at her. All that's on purpose. Right. All that's on purpose. And to leave Kirk out, the only thing I can think of is the um, the woke hate things so much. Uh, and I think uh, Hogwarts Legacy is a good example. It's just a game. Well, it's also a game that hundreds of people worked on. It, yeah. You know, hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of you people worked on that broach the woke. You, it, it, this is... Full out, uh, you know, Stalinism. I'm don't want to get into that. But right, right, you're of course. Either, you're either part of the this intense, you know, group of people, or you're out, and and you have to toe the line 100. percent And and Kirk does not toe that line, and Shatner doesn't toe that line, and he's way too male, and he identifies with way too much in terms of the bare chested heroic moments in in Star Trek. <laughs> Well, and it's, you know, it's funny about that. If you actually watch the show, if people understand the idea that Shatner was this womanizing guy isn't really bared out. Sure, he had a lot of relationships, but if you look at the women that he was oh. involved with, they were scientists and they were lawyers and they were they were very accomplished people. They're a woman that wanted to be a starship captain herself. I mean, he, he was a man with uh, wealth and taste. <laughs> he had great friends. He was the captain of a starship, and it's the the thing that's always frustrated me. It's the pop culture memory, correct? Of, of and the I think character. That's what, that's what I think. Why he's not in that group is the pop culture uh, uh, memory he he he's uh, he's provided. I think that's really the that's what they're angry at. Yeah, and of course, you know, his ongoing beef with George Takei, which I think some of it's performative. You know, I mean, it's, it's, but I mean, I, I think that it's Shatner does get, uh, he's done so much work and he's a man that has demanded respect. He demands your respect and the fact that how many people are his age and, and look as good as he looks. And he's got a documentary of his life coming out, you know, and, and, uh, it's childish. It's childish to leave him off. Yeah. I, I can't think of another word. What petulant children put that poster together? I, I don't know. 
And I, I can't, I mean, he's a man to me that, that was a childhood hero of mine that became a more, even more of a hero for me when I was an adult and actually work with him. And he has always been an inspiration. I mean, we went to the Cannes Film Festival with him. You know, we, we weren't in the festival, but we were in the, the market. And I saw Shatner go up and, and um, do some incredible stuff, you know, and, and he told there was a costume he wore in the movie. And he made up this story when he was giving it to Planet Hollywood and Cannes. He made up this completely <laughs> ridiculous story about how it was a flight hat and a leather jacket, how it had belonged to Eddie Rickenbacker, you know, and he'd found wow. it in a second. He's telling the like all these, and I'm just sitting there like watching this man make up this story. And he's got the this French press in the palm of his hand. And it was... And it was funny because I think when he 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 went up, he said to us, he said to Mark and I, I'm, I'm about I'm about to tell a story that even you you two don't know, <laughs> you know. And he made this story up, and it was he was to me he 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 was a hero when I was a child. He was a hero when I worked with him 25 years ago, and he remains a hero to me today. Have you heard any blowback as to this? No, uh, I mean you know it's we, I think one of the one of the problems is you know. With with our YouTube space, there's a lot of outrage. Sure, of and course. And so the outrage hits hard, and and there isn't a lot of there isn't a lot of of there's no nuance there. No, but, but in this case, don't you think it's deserved? I I absolutely do, and and it's <laughs> you know especially because the man, you know, we've lost Leonard Nimoy, we lost yeah. Michelle Nichols, we've lost, of course, James Doohan, and we've lost. I mean. George Takei and Walter Koenig and, and Shatner are the, the ones who remain, you know, and I think for no other reason than we we should revere Shatner for being here and for still, he's still every weekend, he's going to dates and he's performing. He's he's speaking at, at, at showings of Star Trek II around the country. He's going to Ticonderoga to where they have the recreation of the Star Trek sets, and by the way, if you're a Star Trek fan and you have not gone to Ticonderoga, I've been to those sets. It's James Colley and his crew have done the most amazing job in the world. I have to say that when you walk onto that bridge, man, if you're a Is Star Trek fan. Is that the one in Carolina or it's South in, Carolina? It's in Ticonderoga in New York City, upstate New York. Oh, upstate New York. Close okay. to you. And ah. it's stunning. And Time now they're... they're they, they took uh, over the building next door and they're recreating the next generation bridge. Nice. Um, which is very The Enterprise D bridge from the, the right. TV series. Uh, it's it's uh, amazing. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing ever. So go there. But yeah, it's it. I don't know why they wouldn't put him on there. Why, and I get it. Spock is still in Discovery and Lieutenant. No, Abur, there's no but, excuse. Like, I how know. do you not put Kirk in there? I don't know. You, Archers in there, cartoon you know? characters. You have two effing cartoon characters and not Kirk. I know. And here I'm arguing about Berman. I mean, she's cute. Keep her there. I, I, <laughs> I leave her there. I was a bit mean. I apologize. But well, no, I mean, for no, God's I, sake, get rid of the freaking cartoon characters and stick Kirk in there. I mean, I understand that those are the shows that are new. They're making new episodes and it's running. I understand from a business standpoint. Sure. But they're advertising Paramount Plus and the entire Star Trek franchise. Right. So, I mean, Kirk, James T. Kirk is still, look, he is still the most iconic character in Star Trek history. I mean, you could argue that maybe Leonard Nimoy actually is, but Shatner, come on. It's the two of them. Why I, are, I, are... I think, okay, I think possibly the reason is that would make it three TOS. Well, and, but then why why is Uhura much. there instead of Spock? I know we just recently lost Nichelle Nichols, but and I understand, but but there's still. reasons why Nichelle has to be there. Yes, that's true, and I I, I get that, but still, I don't know. You yeah. know, Shatner's all I know is that his birthday is uh, is 15 days from today, and if He's this is a 92. lousy birthday present, it is a lousy birthday present. <laughs> It's a bummer. Now, can you stick around while we read some super chats, or do you have to go? Because I know your no, wife no. was calling I've, you. I've got dinner, but I mean, she said she's eating, and I'll 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 stick around for some oh. super chats. All right, here's because there's uh so Ed Darlow became a member of the channel. Ed um, Darlow. 
Uh, this is a Black Jack Hooligan says, Hey Rob, what's your favorite band? Growing up, I was around a bunch of alternative Sonic Youth, the Melvins, Slater Kinney. Uh, I went to the Evergreen State College, and it's on Slater Kinney. Uh, that's where that name came from. Uh, my favorites were the Pixies, though. Well, let me ask you. You're a little older than me, and you work with rock bands and all that. Did What are your favorite bands growing up? What were you listening to? Uh, okay, my three favorite acts of all time. Todd Rundgren. Hmm. Roxy Music, Sparks. Wow, those are good. So, did those you are, see this Sparks documentary? Yes, great documentary. And I've she, seen all three live, and um, those were those were my heroic. Those band. are both great. I mean, I I would say that three. the first the, both. <laughs> or, oh, pardon me, all three. I, you know what I was thinking about um, the fact that um, Todd Rundgren was Cameron Crowe talks a lot about Todd Rundgren's music okay. and yeah. big fan of, of Todd. And uh, those are three great choices. And Sparks, what I was going to say, actually, Sparks was going, they were involved in, they were going to work or make, I don't know if they were going to make it or, I think it's in the documentary, uh, a Japanese manga called My the Psychic Girl. Sparks was working on that. And it, it didn't happen. I wish it did. But my first favorite band of all time was The Doors. And then, wow, there you go. Look at that. And they are so great. Oh, they are great. So great. Those guys anyway, are great. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. I was gonna, the Doors was my first favorite band as a kid growing up. And then I would have to say um, Joy Division and New Order. And then, of course, Prince. Prince is my favorite musician. So you're also. definitely younger than me. Yeah. But but I mean the Doors was something I I I loved. And then you know the 70s, I'll tell you something else to be honest. I used to love bands like I loved Styx. I loved Styx. <laughs> Cuz they were they were, you know, I remember the the first Styx album I had was Equinox because the okay. cover of Equinox had an ice cube that was on fire. You know, it was like I found it like at the drop. I'm like, look at this. And then of course the Grand Illusion, to me, it had Come Sail Away, which is about leaving on a starship. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there was another song on that album called Castle Walls that I thought was like, this is like Dawn of the Dead. Um, and then I love Led so, Zeppelin, too. So, you know? so Led Zeppelin, of course, but for, for me, the other bands I listened to a lot were, yes, Genesis, Gentle yep. Giant, um, uh, uh, Ministry, yep. Black Sabbath, um uh, uh, so those were kind of my, oh, and I, and I used to listen to a lot of, uh, Wendy Carlos and yep, me too. Uh, Strange, switched on Bach Strange. and then the, the, the Synergy, Clockwork Orange soundtrack uh, Synergy, uh, uh, Larry fast. I got very much into, um, uh, synthesizer music. So I loved it. You know, I love like Tangerine dream when they scored yes. sorcerer in 76 and then, uh, uh, um, Yellow Magic Orchestra and all that. The, and the German uh, band. Uh, Tangerine Dream. No, no, no. Uh, uh, oh, Kraftwerk. Brand. Kraftwerk. Yeah, Kraftwerk. Very funny band. No yeah. one, I don't think people realized what senses of humor that. Oh, they were the best. They were, they were good. So that's, yeah, that's, uh, and, uh, and we can say now that the music they're making is crap. So I know. Uh, Paul, this one's for you. Mega Reacts wants to know Kenny or Spenny. Oh, Okay, ah, uh, that's interesting. I'll go with Kenny. All right, I don't presume to know what that is, but I will trust that you do. Yes, I do. Uh, Admiral James Tiberius Mork, all the way from Norway. Uh, years and years before I became a Star Trek fan here in Norway, Shatner stunned my life as TJ Hooker. All I wanted to be was a hood-jumping cop. Yep, yep. Uh, which is great. <laughs> Jump oh, that hood. Jump that hood. Walter White Walker says, great Third Rock episode. Shatner tells John Lithgow about fight oh. and said there was something on the wing of the plane. Lithgow, the same thing happened to him because he was, of course, in Twilight Zone, the movie, doing the same part. Big oh. giant head. One of the funniest characters in Third Rock from the Sun. So good. And, and again, sends himself up. There's, I mean, there's just not a lot of actors at that level that would be willing to make fun of themselves. I think, you know, 
uh, at the top of that would be um, Larry Grossman from uh, Tropic Thunder. Oh, I mean, that was up there. That was a Shatner level send up of of one's own stardom. Oh, my God. <laughs> that movie and that movie people were talking about, you know, Ben Stiller had to defend that movie. Oh, it's recently. one of the finest comedies of all time. It's so what do you mean, you people? <laughs> yeah, what do you mean, you people? Genius. It's I, I, and it's so good. That oh. Tropic Thunders and it just recently came out on 4K disc. It's so good. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um Tom Jr. Jackson says Alan King was in Billy Crystal's film Memories of Me. Yes. Um yep. John Burns yeah. says, how did you become a network executive, which you told us? Well, I went to Vulcan, Alberta, and then I fought against a network executive, as one does. That's right. Laugh out mind loud. Your, mind your Vulcan business. Oh, this is a good one. 200 Watt Studio says, Paul, can you talk about the impact and quality of Da Vinci's Inquest? Ooh, you froze. Did I? Uh-oh. Hang on. Can you see me? You have oh. to, you have to uh, say it again. Oh, okay. Um, 200 Watt Studio says, Paul, can you talk about the impact and quality of Da Vinci's Inquest, a Canadian show which, in my opinion, was the inspiration for CSI and its like? Ah, that's interesting. Well, we also had um, uh, the the show that influenced Quincy about a coroner. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, which featured John... Vernon. Anyway, oh, I, I love John Vernon. John Vernon was great. So that's he was why he was in Animal House. Yes, because he was Canadian. Double, du double uh, detention or whatever. Yeah, Se <laughs> double secret Se probation. So he had double secret probation. He was great. Find um, me a way to revoke Delta's he was charter. Great. So uh, I wasn't a huge fan of uh, Da Vinci's. That was a BC show. I, I, I thought it was okay, uh, but it was overwrought for me wasn't wasn't my my shizzle sorry <laughs> um thomas logan says r&b paramount gives you the chance to write and direct the next trek film on a hundred million dollar budget tell us about your trek film will it feature shatner uh well that's a tough thing i can't come up with it on on the spot but i'll tell you what i would do if someone said to me tomorrow you can direct a star trek movie i would go and i would get eric jedrinson's script star trek the beginning and Star Trek The Beginning, Eric Jedrinson was the supervising producer of Band of Brothers for HBO. Mm. He was hired after Enterprise went off the air before J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot took over. He was hired, like Nicholas Meyer before him, to write a Star Trek script. And he had never seen Star Trek before. Mm. So he went and, and watched the show, but he's a great storyteller. He wrote what he called the first part of his Odyssey trilogy. And he wrote a story. It is, it's the Starfleet Academy. It's, it would serve two purposes. It's the Starfleet Academy show that they should make because they keep talking about making one. And uh, who knows if, if I know that uh, Alex Kurtzman wants to do one, but it also deals with the Romulan war, which enterprise never got to. And the, it deals with these new cadets. And what ends up happening is Romulans are, looking to remove they basically want to ethnically cleanse vulcans and they come to earth and they're like they're going to all these other planets and romulans are demanding that we extradite all the vulcans back to vulcan or to them and basically we say fuck off we're not going to do that and so they have to deal with this situation and uh, it's called star trek the beginning i'd call it something else but that script exists. It only has one draft that was done. I loved it. I thought it was canonically interesting. And this this story opens, I've said this before, imagine the opening, the Paramount Mountain, right? Camera's rushing toward the Paramount Mountain. You go over the Paramount Mountain and the camera comes down out of the sky and finds San Francisco. And you see Starfleet headquarters and it rushes out into San Francisco Bay and you see these hover catamarans that are that are skating above the bay, three or four inches above the bay, sails out, but they're hovering. And it's the final graduation of Starfleet Academy is a regatta. So you have all of these new characters, these young characters that were have just graduated from Starfleet Academy competing in a regatta with these hover catamarans. 
And at the same time, you have like Admiral Archer, you bring back Scott Bakula, you have Tom Hanks hire him to be the head of Starfleet. Um, watching this, and this is the this is it's it's like in the social network when the Winklevi are are, are in in uh, yeah. England, but it's a it's a regatta, it's a boat race, and you see the crews of these new Starfleet cadets all working together, and and that's how it starts. That's the opening scene of the movie is in the middle of San Francisco Bay. These are newly new recruits showing how they work together as a team in this sailing regatta. That's the opening scene of the movie. And I when I read the script I'm like, "Oh, I'm in. I'm in." And it it goes from there. And it's the very beginning of it. Very America's Cup. Yeah, very America's Cup, but Star Trek style. Yeah, and, no, I know. I it makes absolute perfect sense. Yeah. And I, I love that scene and it, and it goes from there and it would be three movies, it'd be a trilogy. You make it for Paramount Plus now. And, you, you know, because you amortize the costs of all the sets you're going to build, it's over three films. And let's say you say $100 million, it'll be three movies, so it'll be $300 million. And you're able to do all the things you want to do. It's canonically, it has fealty to canon. You introduce new characters, so you've got your Starfleet Academy spinoff, if that's what you want to do. And, you know, and you've got a connection to the end of Enterprise, so it becomes the next thing and you go into the Romulan War, which is as yet undefined in Star Trek history. That's what I would do. Um, Andy Mays says, thanks for hyping up Picard. I hate modern Star Trek like you, and I wasn't going to watch season three until you began to praise it. And I must say it's great. Now, you too, Paul, you have liked Star Trek Picard season three. A lot. Now, why do you like it? Because people are asking me, Rob, I just don't see what you're seeing in it. It's like the same old stuff. And I'm like... The character work alone sets it way apart from Picard seasons one and two. I would I would say. Um, now you froze. Um, but it's very contemplative. Hang on a second, Paul. For whatever reason, you froze. Oh wait, you're coming back now. Yep, I might. Oh, now I can yep. hear you again. Is it your, me? Your picture. Is it me? That's the problem. We can hear you. It might be. Let me. Can you reconnect to the stream that I gave you? Uh, so I'll, I'll log out and come back in. Yeah, let me log out for you and then just come back in. Okay. Uh, disconnect and then uh, reconnect. And are you there? Yep, I'm, okay. I'm here. Okay, we're good. So that's all we need okay. to do. Okay, so what about Star Trek Picard Season 3 do you dig? So, you know, I've got two hats. I always look at things I can't help but look at things as a network executive and, and I go, okay, can I salvage this piece of shit? What, what's <laughs> going to be done? The, the mere fact that they poured in a bunch of the old cast, just from a cynical perspective would be very acceptable for a network executive. Okay. Sure. From a cold, hard, Hey, you know what? Um, in the same way that um, I would never have accepted JJ Abrams telling me, that we're not putting Han Solo and Leia together in the first fucking movie, okay? I would never have accepted that. So in that same way, in that same clinical, cynical way, the fact that they got the old cast together, fantastic. Um, what they've done is um, extraordinary in the sense that I, member berries is being used as a pejorative yes but the way they have mined the history of uh of uh next gen and also brought in some stuff from the books and um Deep it's Space so Nine thick too. it's so shakespearean and it, it's if I if you could write that at the very beginning and write everybody's Bible that thoroughly and execute it and and bring all that stuff in, first of all, you'd never be able to do it. You right. would not be able to. So, but they've done it. They've done it in the sense that uh, they, they're mining the stuff. The characters are great. Uh, Worf's entrance, I, I almost exploded. I mean, <laughs> that was. That was fantastic. And they let him be manly, even though he likes chamomile tea. 
they you know they they, they did things that they just didn't let Star Trek do because God, men couldn't be men. Well, I'll tell you though, it's the T thing goes all the way back to the second season of Next Generation with Doctor Pulaski, where where he showed her the Klingon tea ceremony, or she showed him they had a Klingon tea ceremony, and then there's the third season Next Generation episode, the Survivors with John, the great John Anderson, and where Picard says, you know, they're visiting and he he drinks tea and he says, good tea. <laughs> nice house so he has a history of drinking tea and one of the things that i love about what terry metallis and his writing staff did is they've they're really it's not a member here's the thing i hate the term member berries oh, because me, it's me too. and it's i didn't become, mean it to you oh no not to me but i mean in terms of the way people are using it it's it's this easy it's for people that don't want to do critical thinking oh it's just member berries or it's just nostalgia i hate that no it isn't because What's interesting about this is these are people, in the case of Picard and Beverly Crusher, they haven't seen each other in over two decades. A backstory. You know, There's tons it, of backstory. And people change. Oh, frozen again. Um, no, you. Oh, did you? Did you? No, I, no, you're good. Okay. Yeah, we're, you're good. Um, here, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll I'll just put you live. So uh, maybe that's the problem. So now you just see me. Um, okay. But but and um, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, but but. It, it isn't just because you're bringing up the past. Uh, it's the way it's used. Of course, of and, course. And I think that the way that they've done this, and you've said this, how how uh, talked about this, I'm talking about other people that throw the word member berries at me, and I'm like, look, you're dealing with characters that have a legacy. Yeah. And and the fact that the fact that they're the next generation cast, all of them even being there would be defined as a member, Barry. No, you're dealing with people that have grown older and changed, and they're different now. But but and my point as a net cynical network executive who's only interested in keeping their job. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. As you said. Yeah. 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 That is a fine thing to do. What, right. What they've done. The fact that Terry's managed to make it work is bonus and i mean i love the fact that Worf says i'm working on myself yes you know why why should he be the same it was so funny everyone was getting mad i couldn't tell people because i'd seen it that when Worf says he's a pacifist now i mean it, it they use it in a comedic ironic yes. way and then of course then you get people that are like well why would why would Worf kill an unarmed man i'm like the guy pulled out the head of a dude like yep. he's already murdered somebody or he ordered someone to be murdered and his henchmen are about to kill this Raffi. Is, this is the first Kurtzman Trek era where the men are not being made fun of and belittled. Right. Right. No, and, it's... and that is so shocking in this show that I, it's just a relief. No, it is. And, and, and the relationship, I love Todd Stashwick's Liam Shaw. Oh, Oh my God! What a great character! Oh Jesus Murphy! And the militarism has been brought back. And yes. when he handed the 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 bridge to Riker, it was great. I mean, was... I have nitpicking of stuff in the first two shows, but you know what? And the other thing that they've done a little bit differently, which is kind of non trekish, but I don't mind, is that they've kind of turned it into a ripping yarn. Yes. Well, it's it's, it's just, a Tom Clancy techno thriller. Yes, that's what they, which is very untrack, but I like it. But wait, do you see? And, and you're going to see this. You'll appreciate this. You know, it really is structured like a movie. Episodes one through four are are Act One. Yeah. When you watch this week's episode, you're going to be fist pumping at the end oh. because it's so rousing. And watch how the bridge crew is used. Uh, and then, of course, episodes five through eight are is Act Two. And speaking and episodes, of plumber, Amanda, um, uh, a, a another offspring. great Canuck, you know, yep. uh, uh, the uh, offspring, and, and she's chewing up the scenery. You know, and it's funny because people are talking about I don't like smoking on Star Trek, but uh, Martia, played by Iman, Star Trek Six, she was a changeling and she was a big smoker. But I just love her. She's like. She's smoking and she's she's uh, drinking highballs. She's the uh, best. And ha shoot again. 
<laughs> it's so good. It again. So yeah. Good. <laughs> so I just totally love it. Yeah, fire it again. Yeah. Where's that brandy? Bring it to me. <laughs> And, and 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 yeah, she, I I love what she's doing, and um, it I, I promise everyone. I, I look forward to seeing how that it all plays out. I and love it's... Shaw. Shaw's great, and uh, well, you know Rat, why you love him. Rat, Do you know why you love Rat. him? He comes out of of Chicago theater and Chicago comedy, Second City. You but know, the, I'm, I'm, but I, he's not just a good actor. I. Love the turn, and now I'm waiting to see whether they can do something with seven and nine, and 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 see what she does next. Um, and I really love how they resurrected Raffi and and her with Worf as a team. I'm really looking for, and it it it, okay. it, it all sure. of it all of it it just keeps getting better and better and better. And because um, she was always a good actress. She was just saddled with, I mean, not great writing. And, you know, it's it's really interesting. It's so funny, like, when people are... The, she, the fact that she's been undercover, you know, and I love undercover cop stories, and when she actually has to take the narcotic, and people are like, oh, she's, she's not an addict anymore. But right. the fact that she was once, I mean, it's hard that, that, that she has right. to do that, but she can take it. She knows what she's going to have to do. But she collapsed anyway, and... Yeah, you know, and more. well, because it was a new thing that Sneed made. I call it, you know, he made this very potent thing that even she wasn't used to. She was like, "I can't." Take Anyways, this. Uh, you know, so I have a very simple rule with any show: Do I want to see the next show? Yeah, yep. That's 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 it. You know, and if you watch my videos, I'll do some reviews. I'll do a green light, red, the green light, yes, no, but I don't review every single show just to gain clicks i'll watch a first couple wait sure. to the very end and then just give a final impression so I'm, I'm not working the material for my benefit i don't do that it's right. not i i can't I, it's just unless i can offer some interesting insight like i did with uh, the she hulks <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> all terrible yeah, then were... i i don't i i won't do it but i mean so far robert really i'm i'm thoroughly enjoying it and uh uh, they just needed to put Picard into Dolph Lundgren's body. I mean, if you're going to pour the brain someplace. Well, like you know, they don't do this, but it's funny because I love Ed Spleers as Jack Crusher. Like, if oh. I was making Picard after season one, you get Patrick Stewart, you've done your first season. I mean, I know they keep him, but I would have I would have resurrected Jean-Luc Picard in the body of Ed Spleers. Uh, and make sense. Ed Spillier's the new guy. I mean, he's. I think he's great. And by the end of the series, you're going to love him because, first of all, he's. I, a I've got a feeling that the the this this it this is almost resurrected all of Star Trek. They they might actually force Terry to do something else and move this forward. Anyways, we'll see. Well, I, you, I will say I this. I got to run. You, you got to go. <laughs> I need to go. All right, Any more sir. super chats? That no, uh, I will. I'll keep going. Um, it's, but I want to thank you, Paul, for being here. I, this is a long time coming. I've wanted to stream oh, with you for, well, let's do it again. We will do it. Absolutely. And I, I love your content, Paul. I already put down your Twitter bio or your Twitter link. Where can people find you online? Um, uh, well, just, you I mean, uh, in terms all, of all the places. Channel, yeah. Your YouTube call channel. Me Chato. Just go to YouTube. Call me Chato. I got another about 23, 2,300 subscribers to hit a hundred thousand so you know if you're fans of robert want to put me over the hundred thousand well there uh, we go there's 400 people 470 people watching right now well, go I, uh, that means 470 people have got to <laughs> subscribe to my channel go to call me chato and uh yeah. and subscribe by the way thank you so much for being here i oh, very much appreciate your time I, I have been waiting for this uh, moment and, uh, you know, free enterprise, like I said, uh, right up there with Galaxy Quest for me is one of my favorite um, sort of Trek. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank Trek you. Movies. That's that's a great company because, man, do I love that movie. Oh, it's it's so good. Anyways, Robert, um, please do what you need to do. And, and, uh, and please tell your wife, to... thank you for loaning you out. She's very kind. She's a good, good person. <laughs> How All do right. I get out of here? Oh, I, I can just, I'll just zap you out. Okay. Bye, Bye everyone. Paul. Thanks for being here. And Paul, I will let you go. 
Well, everyone, I want to thank the great Paul Chato for being here. I've wanted to stream with him for a long time. I've really enjoyed his network executive videos, former network. You know, I love, I kind of, I, I wanted to make him say, hello, Denizens. He didn't, I didn't make him say that. That would have been, I think I would have been too fanboy. So I didn't, I didn't do that. Uh, Andy Mays goes on to say, his super chat says, I'm not crazy about the villain so far. But after the most recent reveal about the disguised antagonist, without spoilers, I'm very excited going forward. I will say this. Um, first of all, uh, there's a lot going on in this show. And um, Amanda Plummer's Captain Vatic, you'll see more of her, obviously. She has a very... a backstory that... I'll say that I sympathize with, and I think uh, you will too, and it's not what you might expect. So stay tuned. John Burns says, Bollywood zombie movie? Ultimate movie idea. I'm surprised they haven't made one yet. Can you imagine the dance number? I mean, it would be Michael Jackson's thriller taken to the nth degree. I'm a huge Bollywood movie fan. I mean, uh, uh, what is it? Is it called Arendent? Robot? You know, watch that if you're a sci-fi fan. I like that. Um, Bert. Bert, who's been a member for... Uh, wait, it's just... Uh, wow, there's... there's a, Wait, hang on. Uh, Bert says, Shatner appeared in one of four Twilight Zone episodes not available during its initial syndication run. Actually, he was only in two. He was in Nick of Time and Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. George Takei was in another. Yes, George Takei was in, he was in a Twilight Zone episode. But Chatner was only in two. <clears throat> uh, John Burns says, Chat, who played Shatner better? William Shatner or Tim Allen? No one plays Shatner better than Shatner. Although Tim Allen was, was good as a Shatner-esque character. Uh, 200 Watt Studio says, I loved the Iliad bookstore, both locations. I miss it. Is is the Il oh I'm in Florida now. How cool was it to be working with a guy that was in Judgment at Nuremberg? I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So, uh, while we were in Cannes, filmmaker Henry Jaglom was making a movie called Festival in Cannes, and Maximilian Schell was there, and Shatner and Maximilian Schell saw each other for the first time since they made that movie, and it's actually in the movie Henry Jaglom's movie Festival in Cannes. It was incredible. It was incredible. We're in the background. Uh, that was 25 years ago, but yeah, there you go. Um, uh, Admiral Terrier Tiberius Mork says, I have to come clean, Rob. The only reason I came to London in 2012 was to shake your hand and partake in 14-year-old Shatner handshake leftovers. <laughs> well, Terrier, uh, my friend Terrier, Terrier Mork, um, lives in Norway uh, I had met him via the internet. We became very friendly. And when we all went to see Skyfall in London, uh, because it opened two weeks before it opened in the U.S., it was the 50th anniversary James Bond film. Terrier and uh, his then lady at the time came down, and we all went and hung out and, and saw Skyfall at the Leicester Square Odeon Theater. And it was uh, a great time. We've been friends, well, we were friends before, and we'll, we'll be friends um, forever. Uh, Torn to Watch Studio says, I love Femme Fatales. I can only watch it in two-minute increments, though. <laughs> well, Femme Fatales, you know, it was the TV show we worked on for HBO and Cinemax. It was fun to make. You know, I'm proud of some of the work I've done in that show. Um, I thought it was good. It was fun. It was really fun, actually, to make. Russman, with a $20 super chat. Thank you, Russman, says, Shatner has been and always will be my captain. Since I was seven in 1966, watching the OG with my older brother. Also, you were right, R&B. Terry Metalis's Trek is very good. You, Dave Cullen, Gary Beekler, etc., overpowered my skepticism. Thank you. Russ, man, wait till this week and the weeks beyond. Um, because it is what people don't understand, and it's frustrating, is the characters are older and wiser. It's all about the emotional connection the characters have with one another. Um, that's that's really what it's all about. So, yeah. Uh, and it just gets, I think, better and better as it goes along. And let me tell you, this show sticks the landing. Just saying. 
Uh, John Byrne says, April wine, anyone? Or am I way too old for this? I don't know. Uh, I don't know what that was. I don't know what April wine is. It rings a bell, but I'm sure Paul might know. Uh, Jake Rowan says, Rob, when was the last time you actually spoke to Shatner? Um, you know, it's got to be like, you know, 10 years ago, maybe. Um, yeah, I think that was the last time we were working on, on Free Enterprise 2 and then it fell apart. And then I saw him a couple times after that. Um, but hopefully I'll be seeing him, him again. It's just, you know, you don't, you work with people, but there's other than if, if we get, if I get to resurrect Free Enterprise and get it out there, cause it's out of print, no one's seen it. But, um, yeah, so I haven't seen him in, in 10 years. Um, John Burns says, have you guys seen Dark Matter, the sci-fi series? Six people wake up in a spaceship. No idea who they are. Canadian showrunner, three seasons like TOS. You know what? I've never watched Dark Matter and people have always told me to. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've been watching a lot of, of Terry Metalis. Uh, I have, I got the box set from Via Vision of 12 Monkeys and 12 Monkeys was a show I watched sporadically. I, I watched all four seasons of it, but it was it, I didn't watch it like I wasn't focused in on it. And watching it now, like binging it, because I have the Blu-rays, it's really good. And it's interesting. I hope that, that uh, Terry, um, and by the way, it should be Terry and Todd Stashwick, whatever Stashwick is going to do. I love that guy. And he has a new book that came. He wrote a a mixology book? I didn't even know this. But um, it's now available. He did a book signing for it last weekend. If I'd really known anything about it, I would have gone to see him. But that guy's dope. I love Todd Stashwick. Uh, he, that guy's amazing. I hope I get to... I, I want to make something now more than ever just to put him in it. I don't even know what he's going to do. I'll just put him in it. John Burns says, I loved Amanda Plummer and so I married an axe murderer. She's amazing. She's amazing. Uh, I've always loved her. I've always loved Amanda Plummer. You know what's really interesting? I was watching a clip. Somebody posted, I think it was, was it Major Grin? They posted a picture. Uh, I, I, I want to say it was an episode of The Outer Limits. It was the Canadian Outer Limits that she was in. Like It had to have been, what, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, with Michelle Forbes, a very young Michelle Forbes. The effects are bad, but she was good. <laughs> um. John Byrne says, if you resurrect Picard, Doctor Who would sue. Um, would they? Would Doctor Who sue? Um, John Byrne says he has cosplayed as Mr. Canoehead. Well, I bet Paul would love to hear that. Uh, John Panora says, Rafi is like Donnie Brasco. Yeah. I mean, um, she is. She act She's totally like that. Absolutely. Uh, Charlie the Unicorn in the live chat says, did Shatner die? Of course he didn't die. He's going to be 92 years old on March 22nd. Uh, don't say that. Don't say that. Uh, Attic Hatch Sound says that um, uh, Amanda Plummer was great in The Fisher King. She was. She's great. Um, John Byrne says in the early 70s, Shatner was on The Magician, which starred Bill Bixby. Anyone? Anyone? I love that show. I thought it was good. Um, I thought it was good. Richard sends in a tip, actually two tips, uh, one of two. I like the new Picard series, but I still don't think seven of nine is seven of nine. She just seems like a, uh, what is that? Loser mama bear looking for some cubs to love in Voyager. She couldn't confirm even if she wanted to, but here she is a sounding board to Shaw. Well, I mean, you know, she's growing and changing and she's gone through a lot. I, I don't begrudge her of that. Is it over for the MCU? I'm hearing that Marvel is responding to Ant-Man's disappointment, but editing out anything negative from the Marvels and doubling down on the light tone. It feels like the Titanic heading for the iceberg at this point. Look, I always take everything that I hear with a grain of salt. Movies are very iterative. Things are always changing when you're making movies. Um, I have to say that that not knowing and here here's what I don't I don't get. I've read the scripts for Secret Invasion. I really love them. I really did. I hope it's great. But, you know, I'm surprised that 
with the subject matter of Secret Invasion, they didn't tie Captain Marvel. I mean, I, I think it's a mistake not to make Captain Marvel 2, unless, you know, it all's... Look, I just think that... I want everything to be good. I love the MCU, but the first 23 uh, Infinity Saga films are great. And um, I, I, uh, I like that. Oh, you know what? Some This is a good point. I thought Shatner, based on the stream title... Um, um, you know what? I'm going to change that. How awesome is William Shatner with Paul Chattel? There you go. How awesome is William Shatner? There you go. I'll change that. And you're right. That That's a misleading title. It is a misleading title. How awesome is William Shatner? Boom. Thank you, chat. You know what? I can change things on the fly and make them better. Our friend Maria Espino is here. Maria says, the foreign library of Netflix is alone worth a subscription fee. Absolutely. By the way, I'll send another email about coming on the show to talk championing reform to the DMCA that partners IP holders with creators. Ooh, I'd love that. Uh, I think it should be reformed. I think you're absolutely right. Um, Thomas Logan says, RMB, I just got my ticket for the PI IMAX re-release. P.I. Um, what is P.I.? Why am I drawing a blank on this? I know I should know this. Um, P.I. What am I? What am I missing? What am I missing, Thomas? What am I missing? Um, P.I. IMAX re-release. I don't know what that is. Um, and I'm drawing a blank. I'm an idiot. Um, so I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know what am, what, what am I I'm missing. Um, uh, Joe Panora says, how about a Kickstarter to remaster Free Enterprise? Here's the thing. Uh, I can't do a Kickstarter to remaster Free Enterprise until I either have permission or control over the negative to do the remaster. Because there's two, there's two phases of it. I have to get our executive producer who owns the movie, to a Life of Pi, to agree. Um he has to allow us to do it. And if he just allowed us to do it, then it would be, then I, then I could do a, a physical, I could, I could do a, a, a Kickstarter because it's going to cost about a hundred thousand to a hundred, probably actually about 150,000 to do all the remastering work. Um, but we don't, or I could raise the money from private equity to buy the movie from him. But either way, I, I and the problem with raising the money is that I don't know if he'll sell it to me. So either way, it's it's problematic, hopefully. 200 Watt Studio says, any good physical media deliveries this week? Yes, but you'll have to tune into the episode of Let's Get Physical Media on Sunday to find out. There's been some good stuff. There has been some good stuff that has come out. Um, so there you go. And on that note... Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, John Byrne says Dark Matter is on Canadian Netflix. I think it's on Netflix here too. What? Wait, I want to know what the IMAX re-release for PI. What is? Hang on, PI IMAX re-release. Mm, PI. What is? Oh, of, oh my God. Okay, I'm an idiot, and you're much smarter than me. Pi. Pi, literally pi, P-I, as in Darren Aronofsky's pi. I'm a stupid idiot, and Thomas Logan, you are not. And by the way, uh, you'll be getting a box shortly. Um, pi, but I'm thinking, I was looking, I was thinking that, that was that was the name of a title as in, it's literally pi, so, but the I, you put a capital I, so I didn't know. So for those of you who don't know, Darren Aronofsky's first science fiction feature Pi, P-I is in the, the number Pi, 3.14, is coming out as an I. It's been remastered in 4K by A24. Well, by Darren Aronofsky, A24 is putting it out in IMAX. Everybody, if you haven't seen Pi, you should all go see it. So check that out because uh, it's an amazing movie. It's an amazing movie. So check it out. Uh, Maria Espino says, I feel that companies are missing out on an exceptional marketing opportunity in this new creator economy by constantly copyright striking fan films and more. I agree with you, 
the problem is here's the thing about companies they would rather rather than say yes and figure it out they would rather copyright strike you but i completely agree i completely agree completely agree with you um so yeah um i i but i agree um so anyway i think i will end i've caught up with everybody uh, I want to end, I'll end this early stream. I want to, first of all, thank all of you. First, thank you to the great Paul Chato for being here. It was great to finally stream with him. We've talked about doing it a lot and I want to thank him for that. I also want to thank everybody that generously supports this channel via super chats and tips and memberships, by the way, we will, we will have another membership call. Not this Saturday, this Saturday, Roberto Suarez and Alex Montana would turn with Que Pasa PGS. So they do our all Spanish show on Saturday morning. So check that out. And um, yeah, so uh, everybody check that out. And I want to thank my moderating staff. Louise X Sparrow is here. And Tom Jr. Jackson is here. And of course, Justin Toner is here. So thank you all for being great moderators, the moderators that you are. Um, John Byrne says that Dark Matter is not on the CW or it's on the CW, not U.S. Netflix. Wow. Uh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Add a catch sound wants to know Pi and IMAX. Yeah, Pi has been remastered in 4K, and they're putting it out in IMAX. I mean, it's going to be a grainstorm, but I, I can't wait to see. It's going to even add to the artistic nature of what it looks like. I'm, I'm really, really excited. So, yeah. Uh, Joey Babui says, thank you for the dank stream, R&B. Did you... Did you smoke out? Did you did you have some dank nugs with this stream? I hope so. I love um, I love uh, hearing that. But anyway, thank you all for being here. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say to all of you, have a better day. <laughs>